Hi everyone, and welcome to Huddle in Place. No, actually it's not Huddle in Place today. <laughs> you really get in the habit of that thing. So today is our Sunday talk within the nine-sided circle. It is, what is it? It is May 17th, 2020. And this is going to be the second in our three-part series where we talk about, what are our three things we're talking about, Mushtaq? We are talking about self-observation, self-remembering, and self-witnessing. Yes. So today is going to be our self-witnessing, self-remembering evening. Yep. And as always, we want to remind everyone who's watching this on YouTube, thank you for joining us. We would love it if you would subscribe to our channel. And if you want to offer us feedback on this video or any other of our videos, you can just press the thumbs up or the thumbs down and let us know what kind of content you're into. And you can add a comment if you like, because that also helps us a lot, whether you're having a thought about the content, something we can improve on, something you're interested in, or just to say hello. We're always looking at our comments and responding when we have them. So thank you very much for being here. Anything else? Um. What are we talking about today? <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, as I mentioned, we are going to be talking about self-remembering tonight. And the way that we understand self-remembering requires a bit of specifying because this is easily construed with other concepts, other types of meditation and practice. And that's part of what we wanted to dig into this evening. So I'm going to invite Mushtaq to get us started. You are? Mm -hmm. Hot dang. Yeah. Okay, so self-remembering was a term coined by Gurdjieff. And um, as was self-observation. The proper term for it is morakabe. Uh, and this, this is usually translated as meditation, though it doesn't exactly mean that. Um, where are my notes? Notes, 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 notes. There it is. Let me pull my notes up. So the literal meanings are like monitoring, observation, keeping an eye on, watching. Uh, and what this is, whereas self-observation was referential and works in the, the existential uh, realm, self-remembering is reflexive. When you are doing self-observation, you are doing uh observation of the objects given to thought when you are doing self-remembering rather than it referring to something outside you are witnessing that which observes you are turning reflexively from that which is given to that which observes the given this is simple, but difficult. Not really easy to do because we spend all of our lives with our consciousness attached to the objects of consciousness. And the first step to making a separation between that is learning this process of marakabe so that you can experience yourself as the awareness that perceives that which is given. So how do you do this? Any ideas? This, yeah, I mean, what are everyone's thoughts so far? When we talk about, you know, reflexive awareness, what does that mean to you? being aware of awareness.
What do you think, Nancy? Oh, I, I'm feeling rather unsure about it um, because I do a lot of self-monitoring of some kind, but I'm not sure if it includes what you're talking about or not. Well, we'll find out. Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> <coughs> so some things have been conflated with self-remembering, and that's been things like observing the emotions. Observing the emotions is not self-remembering. Self-remembering is not breath practice. Breath practice can be used as a doorway to it, but it's not it. And is not the observation of inner states. That's where a lot of people get screwed up as they go, oh, I'm going to self-remember, so I'm going to, I'm going to watch my states. Oh, look, there's happy. Oh, look, there's sad. Oh, look, there's hungry. All of these things. And those are still objects presented to consciousness. All of, this is, you know, things we talked about last week when you're we yeah. talking about, you know, observing your mind going through its movements and things like that. Yeah. And in order to, to get the full process, you have to do that. You have to do the self-observation. Then you have to train yourself in the self-remembering. And only then can you get to the self-witnessing. If you try and just jump ahead, it gets way too muddled. So, what self-remembering is, is observing the observer. And in my um, In the last talk that we did on this, I used the, the, the example of the question, are you awake? Which is a, a simple way to get somebody to look at themselves reflexively and see if they're awake or not. When you look inside and you go, oh, there I am. And you don't even do that, you just, you're just aware. Another metaphor that I ran across recently that's fair to middle and good is Imagine yourself sitting in a movie theater watching a movie, and it's a good movie. So you're really immersed in it. You're identified with the objects of the movie. And then something pulls you out of it. Then you notice you're in a movie theater. Then you notice that you're sitting in a chair in the movie theater. And then you notice that you are watching the movie. Then you notice you. That point is self-remembering. Does, is this sort of making sense? I'm not sure because the thing is that the self-observation is possibly a, an object given to conscious, consciousness. It's got its own qualities. Self-observation is the observation of that which is given to consciousness, yes. Self-remembering is the observation of uh, consciousness itself. Oh, I, okay. I had the terminology wrong. I meant self, is self-remembering, you know, the self which you are remembering, is that also an object given to consciousness? No. Okay. And, you know, if you guys are, are having trouble with this, you're in, you're in good company. Edmer, Edmund Husserl, the uh, phenomenologists, developed existential phenomenology, which is kind of what we were talking about last week. It's, it's equivalent to self-observation. And all of the other philosophers were going, yeah, great, that's groovy. And they developed existentialism from this. And then Husserl said, okay, now you've done that. Let's do the phenomenology of pure consciousness. Let us look at our own awareness reflexively. And all of the philosophers went, wait a minute, that's nuts. We can't do that. And all of a sudden they were all thinking that Husserl had lost it. But 
his transcendental phenomenology, which is what he called that, was by far his most profound work. And it's just really, really hard to do. It's simple, but it's hard. Yeah. And mm -hmm. usually when you start doing this, you can hold that state of observing yourself being, observing yourself, observing your consciousness. You can hold it for maybe a fraction of a second before you're distracted by an object. It takes extreme practice, diligent practice for quite a while to develop the chops to hold that state for 60 seconds. And I remember, you know, I, uh, there are things that are going to pull us out of that state, things that we may need to attend to, like a doorbell ringing or, mm, you know, we've set a timer and it goes off and our attention is going to be drawn to that. Those are things outside, you know, in the world, objects that our, you know, our awareness will be pulled to. And that's going to happen. And then when we return to our awareness of awareness, as it were, it feels like, uh, it can feel like an effort to return to that. Yep. Yeah. And it's interesting because really it takes effort to engage with the world around us to create an ego and live in that ego. And so when we build the skill of returning to awareness of awareness, as we get more acclimated to that, it becomes less effort intensive. It becomes more of the normal state. But of course, that comes with the initial effort that you need to practice in order to feel that state. Does that make sense? <laughs> I mean, um, yeah, developing a, developing a discipline always takes that initial push of ego. Yeah, and this is this is the meat of the work. Self observation is is not that hard. It's it requires some discipline. It requires some some work, but it's not that hard to do. This is incrementally harder because you are not observing uh, an object. You are observing the subject. So how do you do it? It's very simple, like I said. Not easy, but simple. I recommend that you actually do this with your eyes closed to start. First thing you do is you do just a few breaths just to center yourself in your body. And then you notice yourself paying attention to your breathing. That shows you where you are. You don't do any, particularly, any particular breathing practice with it. You allow yourself to breathe comfortably and naturally, and you just keep your mind turned to your own awareness. And there will be little distractions, and every time you're distracted, you just come back to that sense of your own I-ness. And you can, if you get really distracted, you can uh, uh, contemplate Descartes' cogito. Descartes said, I can doubt everything in my experience except the fact that I am experiencing it. So that I that experiences 
is the witness that you observe. You, you take your witnessing self and you turn it on yourself. And you allow it to be there. And when you get it, you get a certain little energy with it as, as a rule. And lots of things will come up all of the voices in your head will want your attention and you just let them be. You don't try and stop them. You just keep your awareness on your awareness. And you do this every day, sometimes twice a day, for as long as you have time to do it. If you can devote five minutes a day to keeping your attention on your own attention, you're doing well. And then if you want, you can try and open your eyes while still holding this state. You get more noise because things are presented to you visually and you just let them be. You can take the, the advice that Adya Shanti gave when he was teaching people meditation, which is allow everything to be as it already is and just be aware of your awareness. Any questions about this? Um, yes, when I try this, I get a sense of a physical quality in sort of, I guess, the back of my head of, I don't know if it's me making an effort to pay attention or, or what. Uh, can you experience your own eye while you're having that physical quality? Letter I. Yeah. Excuse me? Your, your eye eye. Can you experience your own awareness while you experience that physical quality? I think so. Okay. Then let the physical quality be there. Don't try and make it go away or anything and just keep your attention on your own awareness. Now, when you do this, many things will want to distract you. All the voices in your head will get lonesome for your company and they'll want your attention. And they're very sneaky about that. So when they come up and try and get you to focus on them as the object of your consciousness, you have to experience them. You can't block them out. You can't try and force them to stop because that puts more attention on them. You just let them be and keep your awareness on your own eye. You could be in a room full of screaming children and you just let them all be as they are and keep your experience on your own eye. You keep coming back to that no matter what. Now the ultimate dodge on this is called sleep. 
the first thing that will happen, the first stage of this is when you start doing self-remembering, your mind will want to go to sleep because it has nothing to focus on as an object. And that'll happen and that's okay. And then you just, once you come back to your own consciousness, you just go back to it. The essence of this practice is in non-resistance. This is very Wu Wei, as, as the Taoists say. The, the doing of not doing. Because if you can not do all of the things that you usually do to keep your consciousness occupied with the objects given to it, then you get to your own awareness. And if you're not careful, the next thing that happens is you get truth realization. And then you're enlightened. And then you're the Buddha. And then people come and burn incense in front of you. So hopefully you're not allergic. So Noor, add to this. Mm. Give us your perspective. Well, let's see. I think we're always gonna find this more challenging on a day when we're already perceiving ourselves to be stressed out and all that stuff. That's understandable. Yeah. I have noticed that this is really hard to do while you're passing a kidney stone. <laughs> Yeah, so don't beat yourselves up if it's not coming, quote unquote, easily on a day when everything seems really difficult. That's okay. That's what doing this thing in little five minute sessions is for. Yeah. And frankly, the great teachers of the path expect you to not really be able to get this for about a year. It takes about a year's worth of practice to really start building the muscles that do this. Which is not to say that you won't uh, experience benefits from it almost immediately. But yeah, say uh, more about that even. Yeah, the benefits of it are um, a release of stress, a release of tension in your mind and body uh, more of a sense of presence, uh, more of a sense of mental calmness and equi equanimity. And chicks dig it. <laughs> Thank you. Do That's what I've been told. Uh -huh. Zainab, what are your thoughts? Ah, I found out um, usually with the breath practice, um, I end up going towards more just sitting and um, being present. Um, I don't have much to add to this. Yeah, I'm curious, Michelle, what would you say is the relationship between the breath practice and self-remembering? The breath practice can center you enough and it can shut down all of the emotional no noise enough to give you the space to do this. Mm -hmm. That's going to be especially important on a day when tensions are running a bit high. Yeah. So I'm glad that you're finding that that works for you, Zainab. Yeah, breath practice is definitely a doorway to this. Mm -hmm. That's how I'm perceiving it, yeah. So thank you for mentioning that. What about you, Omar? What's on your mind? You look somewhat pensive. 
nothing's on my mind. I'm just observing. <laughs> Yeah. That's oh, fine. perfect. That's then you have perfect. mastered this. Well, I mean, this is actually has been probably my core practice for quite a number of years. So mm. That, and and one of the things that I've noticed at least is that after a while, it seems to, I mean, it's a, basically it's, it's a matter of you know, the way I see this. What what am I? What is where is the attention going? So to speak. And it's tracks. One of the things that that seems to occur is that as I do more of it. Uh, the the phenomena that when, when I start then the doing the self observation process, you know, of looking at what the hell is arising, a lot of the stuff becomes a lot less interesting. And what's become especially interesting is, is the the sort of the, the selfing process, you know, the, the 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 ego creation process. I mean, I mean, I can, it's kind of fun to watch that operate, you know. And every once in a while, there's a cherry on the cake where even the witnessing aspect sort of drops away, and that's sort of cool, you know. But, but I, I think what kicked me into this when I was still a little bit of a wee lad was um, Ramana Maharshi's injunctions, you know, of yeah. how hell are you, you know. Uh, so, yeah, so I mean, I, I have nothing that I disagree with, I think, because this is a great process. And Damn it. Very productive. I'll, I'll wow. find something to disagree with you. <laughs> just to keep you entertained. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I think my main function here is to entertain you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll keep us on our toes. All right. That's also true. But I mean, I think you can help us by speaking to, you know, the your first person. That again puts us in the position of talking about ego, but yeah what it's like from the inside of this process and um you've given us a bit of insight into how that plays out for you personally so thank you yeah and ramana's work was uh really to the point on this practice mm. you know his that i think that that was his major focus is getting people into this state of uh witnessing themselves witnessing pure consciousness yeah. in the moment which you cannot do with the mind interestingly enough yeah, it's a matter of attention i mean you can't, it's certainly not conceptual it's, it's yeah. basically what you what the hell are you, i mean i guess that's not okay so that's that, here's a question for you. i mean attention is what it's a process of some type and it's when that process directs itself to awareness as such that we get this what i think what you're calling is self-remembering and when yeah. that cross attentive process goes toward objects you know then it can pick out interesting objects like you know the processes of of creating these ego dramas and uh, that also works and it's also useful it seems to me you know yeah. um, the process of uh observing the objects given to consciousness is a process that is out of time hence the bracketing we were talking about last week um speak more about that because i'm not quite sure exactly what you're how you so you're if i want to observe uh something that i'm experiencing if i want to observe uh something that say upset me mm -hmm. then I bracket that out of time. I am not ex experiencing the upset at the moment. I'm watching something that may have happened minutes ago. Right. Uh, and that part of the mind that can do that is not the part of the mind that witnesses the witness because that can only happen in real time. When you witness the witness, it okay. happens in the now. Okay, makes it sense. Cannot be it cannot be bracketed. Makes sense, okay. Yeah. 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 And so this actually works on two parts of, of the mind, these two processes that are in some ways distinct from each other. And both of these need to be trained in order to get to the next process, the self-witnessing process. And if you haven't trained both your self-observation and your self-remembering, self-witnessing falls to pieces within milliseconds. And this is something you're going to talk about next time is what next you're week. calling something yep. okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the first time, <laughs> yeah. The first time we talked about this was one of the very first talks that we did. I mean, we were using 
um, what uh, Facebook Live or or something like that, YouTube yeah, Live to talk about it, and Nora couldn't even join in. Uh, that was at the time when we were all typing in a chat box, and then yeah. our staff would have to catch the questions as they got typed in and stuff. Instead of me being able to, you know, handle the the dialogue like happening like this, in the chat. yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. This that was the reason that we went to this platform is so uh, this would not be quite so focused on me because I'm not the only teacher here. Yeah. And we all have things to share. Yeah. And it's so much nicer to be able to see one another. So this has been a huge benefit of this yeah. platform. Yeah, and to be able to talk in real time, mm -hmm. as opposed to in the yeah. door <laughs> has to go. Push talk, pay attention. Yeah. And exactly. Yeah. No, if we could only figure out how to touch via Zoom, I, I, I really miss you and touch them. <laughs> well, you'll have to get your uh, virtual reality suit on. Right. Yeah, and get the goggles and everything, and then we can, you know, with the... Uh, tiles. Ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the positive feedback and everything. Oh, gosh. I don't know if we're quite there yet. but there We really aren't are. quite there yet, but we're sneaking up on it closer <laughs> every day. The incentive for improving the tech is increasing a lot. Yep. yep. Just think if we did have the tactile stuff, remember, Stock, you could do the Zen thing of getting your stick out and hitting us on the head. <laughs> it's true. And we do have suits that will give us that give us that tactile feedback. Mm -hmm. It's just that they are horribly, horribly expensive and you need extremely sophisticated computers to use them my little uh, desktop box would burn out within the first 20 seconds to see if you would help. Though. Yeah, but someday. Okay, so let's go, let's go back to, to the stuff you were talking about. Okay. So um, this seems to be, this, one of the central things here seems to be what the attention is going to, right? Yep. Uh, is it going to objects out there or is it attending the awareness itself? Mm -hmm. So right. speak more about your understanding of what this whole process of attention is. I mean, I, sometimes it just seems obvious, well, I'm just attending, but if I try to really kind of understand what the hell is going on when I'm attending. You know? Okay, a long time ago, and this is something that we're gonna have to revisit again. Uh, a long time ago in one of my talks, uh, I said that, that the person has only three real qualities, and those are attention, intention, and presence. Mm -hmm. Attention directs presence. So mm -hmm. the presence is what you are witnessing when you do self-remembering. The eye that is beyond any object. Uh, so when, when the attention of the presence is on the objects given to the presence, then, uh, that's not self-remembering. That could be self-observation. That could be, uh, observing, uh, what is going on in a, uh, in a phenomenological way, for instance. Uh, I always I always like the idea of phenomenology because Husserl basically did all of this work, uh, you know, almost from uh, first principles without referring to like the works of Ramana or any of the great Eastern gurus who understood all of this stuff very very clearly. Um, so you're saying basically that. Attention and intention are basically, uh, I guess, abilities that awareness has uh, that are not further deducible to something else. Okay, they're not obviously not brain processes or so forth primarily, right? Uh, well, they certainly manifest through brain processes. Right. You know, if you put the electrodes on the head, you can watch the 
EEG do its thing as you alter your attention, or even better, when you're in a uh, fMRI, you know, you can watch the brain do it, do the dance that it does as you shift through this stuff. But that's neither here nor there in, in certain ways. So presence is the ability of being to literally be present to what is given to it. Um, intention is focusing that presence in a particular direction. Attention is attending to what is in that direction, to use a, a spatial metaphor. Yeah, this is going, that three, three part subject is going to require an entire new talk. And we will do that after we do um, self, uh, self witnessing because it's a, it's a very interesting subject, at least to me. Oh, hold on. Oh. Yeah, and, and it doesn't mean we can't, you know, touch on it now, but. Uh... Oh, but I, I mean, I, I would love to, to hear because I mean, sometimes it just seems fucking simple. <laughs> just, yeah. Sometimes when I start reflecting on it, it becomes, you know, it, it's not that simple anymore. It becomes calm. And then yeah. I watch myself going to complexity and say, what the fuck why am I doing there? You know, just. You know, and, it's, it's the mountain thing. You know, first there is a mountain, then there is not a mountain, then there is a mountain. Yep. Yep. So, yes, it is simple. It's not easy, but it's simple. It's like shooting an arrow is the simplest thing in the world. You draw the bow, you release, the arrow goes flying. Even though it's that simple, it's not easy to put the arrow exactly where you want it to go. It can take years of practice to where you can do that consistently. But it's still that same thing of draw the arrow, release. Yeah, I, 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 I think it would require a longer discussion because what, what fascinates me sometimes is how things literally grab the attention, you know, and then, and that's kind of a weird phenomenon, right? Because attention, as, as you I think yeah. point out, is kind of a, a fundamental quality or... or yeah, right? but as you pointed out, and I, I haven't had a chance to reply to it, your, your post in the forum, uh, consciousness is without a doubt intentional. Right. We, we know that really, really clearly. Uh, for anybody who's not sure about that, I uh, recommend Don Eide's book, Experimental Phenomenology. It will teach you all about the intentionality of consciousness. Um, so, consciousness is intentional. We are, in fact, the Buddha who makes the grass green. That being said, it is what do we do with this intentionality? If we just intend to be lost in samsara, to be uh, the, the, the devoted worshiper of Maya, uh, the greatest of all goddesses, uh, that's fine, do that. And if we choose to use our intentionality for something else, for instance, exploring who we really are, outside of all of that stuff, then it becomes a tool for that. I intend to observe my own I-ness. My attention goes to my being and I, my awareness observes my awareness. My being observes my, myself as witness without all of the baggage that we usually carry around. And I assume next time you're going to talk about this 
the phenomena of where this sense of a separate self of just being observed and doing observing sort of drops off, right? Not yeah. exactly. No, yeah. self-witnessing is something slightly different. Yeah. I'll, I'll just wait for next time, so. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, self-witnessing is a little bit different. What you're talking about is is a a whole other process, which will probably have to be two talks down the road. <laughs> there yeah, is a place where, where, where self can drop off, at least momentarily. Uh, Sufis call that fana, which means annihilation. Mm. The annihilation of the self in the one. You experience a, a, a little bit of that when you do self-remembering. Self-remembering is the little annihilation. Because for moments, you experience yourself just as witness. Not as identified with that which is given to the witness, but as the witness itself. And I have to say, in saying this, that language is incredibly imprecise in this. And every time I talk about this, I realize I'm not saying it correctly to the experience of it. I'm just approximating it as best I can. Mm -hmm. And that's so, yeah, I mean, so much about this is experiential, but we do our best to kind of do this dance around trying to get at what that experience is like for those who haven't had it for themselves. And we can only do the best we can. <laughs> yep. And the dance is efficacious to the degree that it actually successfully points at something, right? Right. It's and not just, the, it's not a... Uh, well, okay, for, I guess it could be for different purposes. Never mind. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll drop that through. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the whole dance is just to get you to take your awareness and turn it inward and go, oh, being. Yeah. And, you know, this is why we have so many different kinds of teachers and strategies in the world because it's kind of like sometimes there are specific things that get us into that opening you know that opened things up for us and we're like oh my god i get it now mm. you just had to mix things up and find the right puzzle pieces that fit but they're all going to center around the kinds of things that we're talking about here and it seems to me that one of the benefits of doing what you call self-observation but first before getting to this is that in the self-observation process I think one of the things, at least I learned, is to not, is to at least see when, I, when, I'm, when I'm adding some theoretical concepts or conceptual schemes on top of what I'm observing. And that ability to not, to at least see oneself doing it and maybe not compulsively do it, I think then carries over into the self-remembering and for, for me at least undercuts this tendency to say, Oh, and now I know what the hell I'm seeing. You know, I've got, I've got this. I mean, I've got this, this thing, the awareness thing, which, which I'm. Uh, and once I go to it as a thing that I'm conceptualizing about, I, you know, it loses. I mean, yeah. I'm lost basically at that point. I, yeah. And the self self observation seems to me to be a good drill to not get sucked down in that direction all the time. Yep. Mm. That's exactly right. And that's why we start with self-observation before we get to self-remembering. Yeah. Got to get a little bit good on that before you, uh, you get to, the, to really drill down in the self-remembering. Yeah. All of this is training your awareness to uh, not be identified with the objects of consciousness. It doesn't mean that you can't play with the objects of consciousness. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point to me. Yeah. You can, you can go for the full Buddhahood thing and dissolve into nirvana uh, if you want, but where's the fun in that? <laughs> Which brings to mind Rumi's guest house poem, right? I mean, which is a classic presentation of that. Yeah. 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 Nirvana it means extinction. 
You know that, right? That's what the word actually means. It means extinction. Blowing out, basically. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, you're gone. Poof. So some people want that, right? And they should go for it. But the real nirvana, the real extinction only happens for a moment. Because anything longer in the body dies. And when the body dies, the game is over. It seems like there's almost also sometimes like a historical evolution, cultural evolution as to into this area. Like I'm thinking of the transition between Theravada Buddhism and Mahayana Buddhism, where the Theravada, which was the, the original, at least more original version of Buddhism, you know, essentially is, is, a, is an extinguishing process, you know, you, whereas the, the Mahayana one is much more one that then wants to return to the world and to the marketplace, so to speak, you know. Yeah. And then there's the Vajrayana, where right. you want to have superpowers when you return to the world. Right. I like that one. <laughs> you would. <laughs> Somehow it doesn't surprise me. You know? <laughs> um. Yep. I want the superpower to create a whoopee cushion under anyone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That would be a good superpower. <laughs> In the meantime, you'll stick with swords. Eh? <laughs> you'll yeah, stick with swords. Swords aren't a superpower, but they can be very, very useful for keeping you awake. There is nothing like a, a blade coming at your face to give you that sense of immediacy. Mm -hmm. Okay. So since I'm here to entertain you, um, the this, this sense of the immediacy that, that you get when the blade is coming at you, that produces a, a shift of attention, right? Mm. And it, I mean, you become very, presumably, very much aware of, in the self observation sense of, of that thing coming. I've never had a blade come at me, but I've had karate kicks come at me and so forth. You know? well, and so, I mean, it definitely focuses your attention, right? It can. Does it? Here's the thing, though. If it does, you lose. Because mm, you're too much. Yeah. In, right. Which even, is where you're... even if somebody is younger and stronger and faster than me, I know that if I can get them focusing on my blade, I'll mm. beat them. Mm -hmm. That's Which all. Which is why you're proposing your void practice, right? Of, of yeah. becoming aware of the space within which this is happening. Yeah. yeah. I try and fence from the void. Mm. And, mm -hmm. and as Musashi says, there is timing even within the void. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, one of the things that I, I have all these strategies for getting my opponent to pay attention to my blade, to look at my blade, to focus on my blade, to keep his mind on my blade. And the more he does that, the easier he is to beat, mm -hmm. even if he is theoretically better than I am. And I guess what, where I was going with that, what was interesting to me was, I mean, sometimes I think, well, I, well I'm, I'm supposing, and I don't know if I, I'm guessing at this point, that there are martial arts oriented processes at trying to get to self remembering and presumably self witnessing, whatever that is. Uh, how do they work? I mean, how, how, how does or does martial arts itself provide a pathway for this? It seems like, at least in the Japanese culture, or maybe some other cultures, that was a pathway. The pathway was attached to martial arts. Mm -hmm. Martial okay. arts is just fighting. Okay. There's you, there's these other people, you go over, you try and beat them over the head with a stick, they try and beat you over the head with a stick, somebody wins, somebody loses. As that evolves, the martial artists who lived noticed a few things. Having somebody trying to kill you is a great way to go into flow. Okay. When your life is being risked, flow tends to come to the surface. And so you got these guys who lived and they went, 
how did that happen? And they start thinking about it. And one of the things that they notice is that when they get into that flow state, they are not afraid of death. They can embrace their own death. And that's, what, that's where the Japanese went with this. Mm -hmm. Musashi said, the way of the samurai is found in embracing death. And so you had all of this training to keep you calm in the face of potential extinction, which as a sideline occasionally produced enlightenment. Mm -hmm. So that's how that got there. It, it's training to keep you calm and focused in a particular way within the milieu of a bunch of people trying to kill you. Okay, makes sense. So talk a bit more about the relationship between flow state and either self-remembering or self-observation. They are related to, the flow state is somewhat related to uh, self-remembering in that uh, self-remembering can often get you into the flow state. But the flow state requires external stimuli of some sort or another. I mean, you have to be engaged in doing something? Yeah, you have to be engaged in doing something to hit the flow state. Okay. Okay. It might be running. It might be fencing. It might be jumping off the side of a mountain with a wingsuit. It might be surfing the big waves out uh, in Hawaii or someplace like that. Uh, it might be uh, having a helicopter take you way the hell up on the top of a snow-covered mountain and skiing down in ways that nobody has ever done before. All of these things are the doing that can put you into the flow state. When you are in, to, in the flow state, you are in a state that is close to self-remembering, except that the witness is witnessing that which is given to it, not itself. If the witness turns around and bees reflective in a situation like that, you die. Mm -hmm. And this has happened. You know, people get deep into flow and they, they get this, oh, I can turn around and just watch myself being. And they do. And it's great. And it's groovy. And then you hit the side of the mountain. Mm -hmm. And poof, you're enlightened. That certainly is one of the methods, isn't it? <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Extinguishment um, in real time. Yep. And one guy I heard of had a process called Colt 45. Bang. Now you're in life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, but as with those sorts of things, the person who experiences that can't really tell you what yeah. it's like. So, basically, there you have it. That's what I got to say on it. Noor? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think this is pretty good, and we're certainly going to touch on this again next week, inevitably, because it's part of leading into self-witnessing. So, we'll be talking about that. Yep. Self-witnessing any... will actually be more efficacious for the flow state than self-remembering. Yeah. Yep. So, we'll touch on that, too. How's it going, Sheree? Got anything you want to add? No? No, I don't have anything else to add. Mm -hmm. Darn. Well, it's interesting to hear all of that because uh, it just reminds me that my other teacher, he just says to me, be here now, suspend all judgment. Mm -hmm. I think that's the part of when you're trying to be observing yourself that you throw in all these things and you're trying to overanalyze, overthink over judge and he just says just be here yeah just it the end again incredibly simple not necessarily mm -hmm. easy don't make a story is yep. another one don't yeah. make a story stop it stop no story <laughs> so we sit in silence yeah cool yep mm -hmm. yep do, has Lawrence ever considered writing a book? We have asked, and the answer hasn't come forth. 
have you guys ever considered putting together a book of his teachings? Uh, you can ask Dave about that. Okay. He has a copy of uh, lots of recordings of Lawrence. I don't have anything. Except your memories. Uh, I was hoping that Dave would be able to put a compilation or something together and be able to share it with Lawrence's students, but that hasn't come to pass. Yeah, that's something that I think really should come to pass at some point because otherwise it gets lost. Mm. And that would be a shame because obviously he has really good advice. Yeah, that's why he's our beloved teacher and he will cut through your crap in a hot second and there is no but ifs, buts or anything. It's sure. And you just think, oh, right. Back to it. Yep. So who is this Lawrence character? He's this enlightened guy up in Bay Area, in the Bay Area. <laughs> Does he have a last name or is it his first name? Uh, not that I know of. Oh, okay. Yep. But I do know he is an, he is an enlightened guy. He's one of the ones. He's very special. Yeah. He's very special, but he's not taking students or anything. And if anything, his physical uh, condition at the moment is he's on his way out. Sorry to hear that. Well, he if anything, that's. Uh, oh, sorry to interrupt. I was going to say that it, that's part of the learning is that if you are dependent on your teacher, you've stopped learning. You've just hoping to be fed. And, and he's talked about this with me. He said he will only take on people who work. And the reason is people often love the workshop when he was doing them at the time, but he, they are actually living off his energy. He doesn't have enough energy to give out that way. He said, this is work. You do the work. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. it, the end. Mm. It's pretty critical to kind of be aware of those interactions and to mm -hmm. um, be mindful of how they play out and how they do, they can be draining those interactions. Mm. So. Yep. Mm -mm. Yeah. But no, it was a great talk. Um, I'm going to have to leave because I have another engagement. So thank you, you for you today. Go play some more tennis thank again? You. Yeah. Uh, no, I just have another meeting I have to do too. <laughs> this right. is no, the day no. for it. Thank yeah. you so much for coming. Thank and you. And we're going to be bye -bye. wrapping it up anyway. So. Yeah. Bye. Any other last questions before we wrap this up? No. How no? about you, Nancy? How are you doing? Actually, pretty well. The Whatever I've been trying to do to observe myself observing has steadied me a lot, which I obviously needed. Mm. Good. And That's I will awesome. also add that one of the things that throws me off is self-congratulation for getting this far. Mm. Yeah, that will do it every time. Been there, done that. <laughs> yeah. We need a t-shirt for that, or at least a button, Nancy. Right. I screwed right. my process by patting myself on the back. I'd right. I could go through spiritual materialism and probably get 20 slogans out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Likely, yeah. It's a thing. But, I mean, that's... that's uh self-observation in action yeah yep so that's great cool so i think zainab's all set nancy seems like she's in good shape omar are you doing good for this talk oh, i'm fine excellent good cool. in that case i am going to shut off the recording and yeah. say goodbye everybody bye thanks for bye. being here